Well, good morning, Brushy Creek. It's good to see you on here this morning, hopefully. Um, I'm excited to be closing out First Peter with you guys this morning. I got to start it with you, and um, I get to end it with you, so that's exciting. I really appreciate all of our staff jumping in and helping us with this endeavor, and I hope that you're enjoying it, and I hope that you're getting a lot out of it. So um, as we look at this last portion of First Peter today, let's start by just going to the Lord in prayer. God, I just thank you for all of those families represented today um, watching this lesson. And God, I pray that your word would speak to us and that it would penetrate our hearts. God, I pray that you would um, guide the words coming out of my mouth and that I would only say those things that um, would honor you. God, um, I pray that you would just illuminate your word for us. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, um, today we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to look at the second portion of verse 5 through the end of the chapter, verse 11. Um, so let's go ahead and just read that together. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firming your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, there is a lot in that passage, and so we're going to break it down and look at um, exactly what all is going on. Um, so first off, let me just ask, have you guys ever been on a journey and you got to the end of it and thought, that was totally not worth my time? Um, when I was, I just finished my junior year of high school, uh, junior year of college and was getting ready to start my senior year, my family went on a fabulous vacation out west and we just took four weeks and um, mostly tent camped all over the western part of the United States. And um, there came a point when we were in South Dakota that we drove for about four hours from our last location to get to Mount Rushmore. And we were so excited, couldn't wait. And we drove and we drove and we drove and we pulled into the parking lot and got out. And there was Mount Rushmore in all of its glory. And we took a picture and we got back in the car and we started driving again. And it was such a letdown because really and truly it looked just like the postcard. And that was about it. And we realized there had been hours out of our lives and out of this great trip just to see this thing that pretty much looked just like the postcard. And that was it. Um, probably not worth the drive for me. Um, now, let me tell you about another drive, which was about twice as long as that drive to Mount Rushmore. And that's when Matt and Carla, my brother and sister-in-law, moved to Williamsburg, Virginia. And they took my niece, Scout, who at the time was um, about a year and a half. Um, I think she ended up turning two, maybe in Williamsburg. Um, but they moved there for about a year. I made that drive several times. It was about a seven and a half hour drive to Williamsburg. And never, ever, regardless of how short the trip had to be, never did I get home and think that wasn't worth it. It was always worth it to get to spend time with Scout and with Matt and, and Carla. So today we're going to talk about a journey that we're making, our journey to eternity, our spiritual journey here on earth to get to that hope that we've been talking about. And let me just tell you, it's totally worth it. What we're going through here on on earth is totally worth um, what we're going to get to experience in eternity with Jesus. Um, you know, I want to read to you a quote from C.S. Lewis. 
he wrote this in Mere Christianity. Um, in a portion of Mere Christianity, he writes, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably, earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. Um, you know, as we've studied First Peter together, we've seen how Peter was urging fellow Christians to stand firm in the living hope that they had in Christ. Lizzie Beth really encouraged me over the last two weeks. Um, she, she brought up several times the idea that um, what we're suffering here on earth will be the only suffering we'll ever have to endure. And I'd never thought about it that way, to think about if I can get through this, then this is as bad as it's going to get. Um, as a believer, putting my faith and trust in Christ and knowing that my eternity is set in a glorious place with him, apart from any suffering, any tears, any hardships. And um, so that's really exciting to think about. This is, for a believer, as bad as it gets. And, um, and I think that, for me anyway, helped me think about being able to endure it more. Um, so let's read together again. I'm going to start in the second half of verse 5 and go through verse 7. Listen to this again. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. You know, earlier in this chapter, um, Paul had been talking to those who were shepherding his people. So, you know, the pastors, the leaders in this particular area. And he warns them not to do it out of compulsion, but to do it out of a willingness, um, not to lord over the people, but to, um, to live as an example to the people, to eagerly point them to Jesus. Um, and he says to do it uh, not for their own sakes, uh, but for the sakes of the people. He didn't want them shepherding the people out of uh, wanting power or wanting position or wanting um, monetary gain or popularity. He wanted it to be a pure um, want to lead the people to Christ. And then he says to everybody here in this passage that we just read, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. That word clothe is interesting. It's the only time we see that particular word for clothe used in the New Testament. And a lot of scholars believe it was actually a term that referred to a particular apron that slaves would wear. Um, and so kind of what he's saying here is clothe yourselves in service to one another, that we need to be willing to serve one another, that we need to be um, willing to see others as more important than ourselves. It says that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Are you allowing God to use your suffering for his glory by being humble? Um, when I was reading that, I immediately went to one of my favorite passages in scripture in my head, which is Philippians chapter 2. And um, I want to read verses 1 through 11 to you of Philippians chapter 2. So, so, there, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself 
by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. That sounds very similar to what Peter is telling the people here. Um, Jesus humbled himself for God's glory and for God's plan to be done to bring us to himself. And this last verse reminds us that the Father did for Jesus what he promises us in 1 Peter 5, 6. Listen to that again. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. So just like he exalted Jesus, there will come a proper time where um, God will take you out of the suffering that you're enduring, and he'll exalt you to the place where he wants you to be. But it's at the proper time. As believers, we need to be um, kept in mind that the proper time may not be here on this earth. You know, there are tons of godly men and women who have died as martyrs, died suffering for the cause of Christ. And um, scripture later talks about that um, they were given their honorable place. Um, and so we need to remember that God will exalt you to the place he wants you to be when we humble ourselves. But we also need to remember that we're not promised that it's going to be here on earth. Um, John 16, 33, Jesus actually speaks to that himself about what we can expect. Listen to this. In John 16, 33, Jesus says, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus doesn't promise us an easy time without suffering here on earth. He actually does quite the opposite. He actually tells us, you will have trouble, but your peace, your joy can come from me. And so we need to keep that in mind. Now, when we look back at 1 Peter chapter 5, look again um, after it says, humble yourselves and that at the right time, God will exalt you. Look at verse 7, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Um, it tells us that though there's trouble, we can cast our cares on Jesus because he cares about us. So there's a couple of little words I want us to look at there. Um, the first one is cast. Uh, a lot of you may be fishermen. I am not a fisherman, but I've certainly grown up around fishermen. Um, almost every vacation, it seems like we end up fishing at some point, and that's just not my thing. But I've picked up a thing or two, and one is how to cast a line. And casting simply means taking it from one place and putting it in another place, right? And so if you've got a rod and reel and you cast your line, you're taking it from here and sending it out there where the fish are. Um, here's the thing, and I thought this might be a fun little way to think about it. You know, a lot of us grew up just plain old fishing. And you cast your line and you let it sit and wait and you wait until what you're hoping for happens, right? Um, but then as I got older, I started seeing some people fly fishing. My brother loves to fly fish. And fly fishermen cast and pull, cast and pull, cast and pull. And um, I know I'm making that more simple for those of you who are actually fly fishermen. Um, but that's what it looks like, throwing it, taking it back, throwing it, taking it back. Well, when we think about casting our cares on Christ, we don't want to be fly fishermen. We want to give it to him and leave it there. And, you know, so many times I think we're more like those fly fishermen. who We say we're going to give it to God, but then we jerk it right back. Um, so we need to be very careful to give it to God and leave it there, to cast our cares. What are our cares, our worries, our anxieties, to cast all of that on God? Trust that God's grace and power is enough to enable you to endure any circumstances. Um, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 9 and 10. Listen to what Paul says. But he said to me, now remember this is, Paul is talking 
uh, well, he's writing this letter to the Corinthian people, but he's talking about this thorn in the flesh that he's had. And um, he's asked God time and time again to take it away. And he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Um, so Peter says here in 1 Peter 5 that we can trust God because he cares about us. Um, listen, I care about my niece and nephew. I have a niece, she's 12, or I'm sorry, she's 14. Her name is Scout, and I have a nephew who is two, whose name is Charlie. And I care as much about them as I care about anybody in the world. And so as much as it's in my power, I always try to protect them. I always try to make sure that good things are happening for them and that they're never in harm's way, that they never get hurt or in danger. But that doesn't always mean that I give them exactly what they want. You know, there are times that Charlie hates to be in a car seat. It restricts where he can move, and he likes to move. Um, it restricts what he can see sometimes. I know he must be sore sitting in that same position all the time, and so he gets fussy. And it's within my power to stop the car and unbuckle him and let him out. But I know that that would be so dangerous for him. I know that that would not um, keep him safe. And so even though it's within my power, I restrain that because it's for his best. I want you to think about if I care that much about Charlie, how much more does God care about us? Um, so to show God that we trust him to take care of us, we need to cast our cares on him. And we need to make sure that we recognize that even though sometimes we're going through hard times, sometimes even though we're going through things that don't feel comfortable, that God has a plan and that he is in control and that he has our best interest at heart. Um, and sometimes our best interest is to make us more holy. Sometimes our best interest is to make us more loving, more obedient, more dependent on him. Um, he wants us to experience the real joy that only comes through being obedient to him. And sometimes that comes through suffering and pain. Um, I want you to look at verses 8 and 9. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. It says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firming your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Wow, there is a whole lot in just those two verses. Um, not only do we need to cast our cares on the Lord, we also need to be alert. We need to be sober-minded. Um, we need to not get lazy or underestimate our enemy, Satan. You know, you see this throughout scripture. Remember when Jesus um, is getting ready to be betrayed and he takes his disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, be alert, stay watchful and pray. And remember three times they fall asleep and he comes back and be alert, be alert. Um, this is a, something that goes throughout scripture, reminding us to be alert, to be sober minded, to not let other things take control of our minds and our hearts so that we can be aware of what's going on and aware of the enemy coming at us. Um, right now I'm reading a book called Fervent by Priscilla Shire, and it's all about learning to pray fervently and keeping our head in the game through prayer. Um, here's the thing we need to do. We need to remember that Satan's looking for a foothold. He is looking for somewhere that he can take you down as a believer. Um, nothing delights him more than to not only turn you away from God, but to turn other people through you away from God. And so he's constantly looking for ways to get into your life and to twist and turn what 
um, God has meant for good in your life. Um, and number two, we need to keep in mind, while Satan is a powerful adversary, he's no competition for our God who cares for us. Um, in 2 Kings chapter 6, there's a great story about Elisha, and he and um, one of his servants are in this little house cabin thing, and um, when the servant wakes up in the morning and goes and looks out, he's terrified because these other kings have surrounded um, the their encampment, and they're about to be attacked, and and his servant is just in a bad way. He just thinks the end is here. And Elisha prays this beautiful prayer where he asks for God to open his servant's eyes. And when the servant looks out again, he sees all of the spiritual battle that's going on. All of these great angels and chariots who are there to defend. And they end up winning the battle without ever fighting. The armies uh, take each other out. And Elisha and his servant just sit there and wait for the battle to be over. It's a beautiful picture of how God always wins um, and how no matter what the devil comes up with, no matter what schemes he tries, um, even if it causes the death of some believers, God always wins. Um, and that's a great, great reminder. It's interesting there's a cycle here. I want you to think about it. All this works together. It says, be humble. And in being humble, recognize that we have an enemy. And in recognizing that we have an enemy, give the battle to God. And then we cast our cares on him and we give the battle to him. We need to stay focused on our obedience. And as we do that, we need to make sure that we're not focused on ourselves, which in turn makes us humble. Do you see how that is? And when we do that, I want you to look at verse 9 again. Resist him, firming your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. We, it makes us not focused on ourselves. It makes us other focused, right? And that's what God's calling us to do in this passage, to stay humble, to put others before ourselves to not get bogged down in the hardships, but to give them to the Lord and to trust him and to be obedient to him. You know, recently I've heard a lot about um, that we're living in the last days. And listen, maybe we are. Um, people have been looking for the coming of Christ since the day that he ascended into heaven. And I certainly hope that the day is near because there's nothing I would love more than to enter eternity with Jesus right now. Um, but I think we need to be really careful as Americans, especially, you know, we're, we're having some hard times here, times that we've never experienced before. But I don't want us to get too inward focused, because we have brothers and sisters around the world who have endured way more than we're enduring right now for centuries. Um, I want you to listen to this. Every month, somewhere in the world, 345 Christians are killed for faith-related reasons. 105 churches and Christian buildings are burned or attacked. And 219 Christians are detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned around our world every month. Um, we need to be praying for all of our brothers and sisters. You know, it's like things got bad and we all of a sudden think this is the end of the world. But we've had people living like this for centuries. And so instead of being inward focused right now and being scared, cast those cares on the Lord. Know that he's going to take care of you. Know that he's wanting you to be humble. He's wanting you to be prayerful. He's wanting you to be obedient to him. And regardless of what happens, whether he comes back, whether he doesn't come back right now, he's coming back but it may not be in your lifetime. It may be. Either way, he wants you to put your cares in his hands, to put your worries, your anxieties in his hands, and to trust him. Um, look at verses 10 and 11. And after you have suffered a little while, 
the God of all grace, who has called you to him. I'm sorry, I misread that. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right, so I want us to look at this for a second. It says, to God of all grace, who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you've suffered a little while. So we've already said, Jesus said, we are going to suffer. Sometimes we'll suffer until eternity. Sometimes it'll just be for a little while. But God promises to always restore, establish, strengthen, and support. So let's think about what that means for a minute. To restore. To restore something means to put it back in its rightful place. Um, you know, you think about, I've, I've heard anyway, about um, people who have broken bones. Um, thank goodness I've never had to experience this. But I've also heard about people like a hip popping out a joint or a bone being broken and that the doctor has to take it and snap it back into position. Um, and I've heard that's very painful. But I've also heard that once it's snapped back into position, a lot of the pain is almost immediately allevi alleviated. And so God restores us. He puts us back in our rightful place. Again, that may be in eternity. That may be here on earth. It also says that he establishes us, that he gives us a firm footing. Um, many of you know I struggle with vertigo from time to time. And, um, man, whenever things get where my world really gets topsy-turvy and I can't figure out, I always try to hold on to something. And before I take a step, I make sure I have a firm foundation. Um, some of you may have gone on a hike or something and you start to stumble and you stop and with your hiking poles or with a tree or with a friend, you establish a firm foundation before you take that next step, that next step. Um, God says that he'll do that for us. When our world's upside down, that he will establish our footing. He'll give us that firm footing. And then it says he'll strengthen us. Um, and this is really interesting because just like where Paul said, it's in my weakness that I see strength. Um, isn't it always in our weakness where we see God's strength? You know, when we're doing things within our own strength, we lose sight that God's even there sometimes. But when we're completely weak, it's when we can most um, wonderfully see God's power and God's strength. Because we recognize that had nothing to do with us. It was only because of him and his power and his strength that that was able to happen. Um, I was reading last week about Rahab. Um, and do you remember Rahab was um, the prostitute that when Joshua sent spies into Jericho before they marched around the walls of Jericho, he sent, two, uh, he sent a couple spies in and they established a deal with Rahab, right, where um, she protected them and they in turn protected her family when the walls of Jericho fell. But what's interesting, and I've never noticed it before, when Rahab's talking to the spies, she tells them something. She says, all of the people's hearts here in Jericho have, are trembling in fear at your God. We've heard all about him taking you out of Egypt, him bringing you through the Red Sea. And, and our hearts are terrified and trembling at what he can do. Now, I want you to think about this. All of those things that she mentioned that are cause for the people of Jericho to fear the Hebrew people. They all happen before the 40 years of wandering. They all happen before Moses sent Joshua and Caleb and the other spies into the land to see if they could take it. Do you remember when Joshua and Caleb and the other 10 spies came back and they said, oh, it's a great land but there's no way we can take it because they'll overpower us. And because of those decisions, Joshua and Caleb were the only two that said, God can give it to us. And so they were the only two allowed into the promised land. The other 
spies and not just the spies, but all the people ended up wandering in the desert and never got to see the promised land. Even Moses himself didn't get to see it because they all lacked faith that God could give them, give them the land. Well, here's what I want you to see. Rahab says, we're terrified of who your God is. Well, guess what? If they were terrified 40 years later, they were terrified 40 years before. So God absolutely could have given them the land. Um, not that we needed Rahab to tell us that, right? But man, those spies sure missed the mark because they failed to recognize the strength and the power of their God. Rahab and the people of Jericho recognized the strength and power of God, even when the Hebrew people didn't recognize it themselves. I thought that was really interesting to help us remember that it's in our weakness that we're able to see God's strength. So he'll give us, he'll restore us to our rightful place. He'll establish us a firm footing. He'll strengthen us through his power and he'll support us. He'll be that support beam. Earlier in first Peter in chapter two, um, we learned that Jesus was the cornerstone of our faith, the foundation of our lives. And that it gave, it gives us a rock solid foundation. Um, so I think it's really important to remember that this God who's calling us to cast all of our cares upon him loves us, cares for us, and promises us restoration, establishment, strength, and support through his son Jesus. And then it ends with verse 11, to him be dominion forever. Amen. Dominion is a display of strength and power. And so all of this is true so that God can show his mighty strength and his mighty power forever. And that's just amazing that we get to sit back and watch. So be encouraged that we have hope that no matter what happens, no matter how bad COVID gets, no matter how bad the economy gets, no matter how bad um, culture turns on Christianity, we will be victorious. Maybe not here, but in eternity, because God has given us a glorious hope through his son, Jesus. And so if we have faith and trust in the blood of Jesus Christ, we can take heart in the fact that this suffering is just for a little while. And there's great there's a great, great future ahead for all believers to spend an eternity with Jesus. I hope you have a great week. I hope this is encouraging to you to think through how much God loves you and how much he's going to take care of you and how we really need to um, let go of our, our fears, to cast them to Jesus and leave them there, knowing that he's going to take care of us, whether in this life or the next. We have a promise of that, and he always, he always fulfills his promises. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for being a promise keeper. God, I thank you so much that we can trust in you, that you have um, ultimate power and ultimate authority. And God, that no matter what game Satan plays, that he'll always lose. And so God, I pray that we would cast our anxieties on you and that we would rest in the fact that you will always be victorious. God, even in that, though, help us not to get lazy. Help us to always be sober-minded and to always be alert, watching and not allowing Satan to get a foothold in our lives, but turning to you in prayer and asking for you to make us um, the people you want us to be. We love you, Lord, and I pray that you'd be with us this week. In your name I pray, amen. I hope you guys have a great week. Thank you so much for joining us today.